Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Bustamante, and today we're going to start natural selection. So we're starting off at 7.1, Introduction to Natural Selection. Basically, we're going to try and describe the causes of natural selection and explain how natural selection affects a population. Here we go. So first I want to talk about what is evolution, right? Evolution is really just change, changes that we see over some given amount of time. So evolution, when we're talking about it in biology, right, is the change in genetic makeup of a population over time, and it's supported by different lines of evidence. So why do scientists use this, right? Why do we think as scientists that evolution is occurring? Well, we can look at all these different forms of evidence. Um, that would tell us, oh, this change is happening and we're seeing it over and over and over again. Sometimes you'll hear evolution descent with modification, right, because they're causing offspring from one generation to the next. And as those offspring uh, continue to survive and hopefully thrive, right, we see them get modified over really, really, really long periods of time. Um, some of that evidence we're going to use to kind of look at this viewpoint of evolution is geographical, geological, physical, biochemical, even mathematical data, right, to show us that, hey, here's why scientists say evolution is happening. Here are the changes that we can see based on evidence that we see. And so really what natural selection is is a mechanism to explain how this evolution is occurring in a population. Now notice I keep saying that evolution and natural selection occur in populations, right? We can't have natural selection uh, in an individual or really even necessarily evolution from a biological standpoint in an individual. So we're always going to be talking about populations, about groups here. So what's natural selection? Natural selection then is the mechanism to explain evolution scientifically, right? Uh, basically, it's what we think based on science is causing these changes over time. It's the process by which organisms and adaptations are suited for a particular environment. And if they're suited for that particular environment or better suited for that particular environment, they have a greater chance of survival and reproduction. And therefore they pass on the adaptations that they have onto their offspring. And so we start to see those particular traits become more prominent in the offspring. So it's the theory that populations that are better adapted to their environment will survive and reproduce. And of course, in their reproduction, right, they also uh, create viable offspring so that their offspring can go ahead and have um, viable offspring as well, right? So here's kind of an example of what we're looking at. Like, um, say we have these beetles and some bird that eats them. Maybe you have green beetles and what is this, like tannish color beetles. And it's easier for the bird to see the green beetles, so he eats the green beetle beetles first. And so over time, you see that these uh, tannish beetles will become more prominent in the population. So let's talk a little bit historically about how we get to the idea of natural selection, which scientists currently use to explain the process of evolution, to explain this process of change over time. And a lot of times we think just about Darwin, but there were actually lots of people kind of looking into this and thinking about this and trying to trying to figure this out, right? Because at the time that we um, start to hear about Darwin and Darwin's theory, um, it kind of really went against the general population's belief about organisms and how they were created and if they even changed over time. So the first person I want to talk about is somebody called Lamarck. Um, we don't actually, I know this is going to be a spoiler alert, use Lamarck's ideas, but um, he was kind of thinking about how organisms changed over time, and he said that organisms actually adapted to their environment, right? So if they used something a lot, that their body could change and become more beneficial to them. This is always the good example of the giraffe, right? We know that giraffes need to reach up high to access their food, right? So he just thought, well, if a giraffe continually stretches its neck, right, if they use that feature a lot over time, it will grow and you will see giraffes in a population with longer necks, right? 
or if you didn't use something, that that trait would kind of slowly disappear or not be so prominent, right? So he had this idea that organisms change throughout their lifetime through use and disuse. And uh, that basically you could change things in an individual with perfection and time. And then you could transmit acquired characteristics onto the next generation. He was really kind of the first to offer this hypothesis about how evolution occurred over a long period of time. Um, but actually, he's not who we talk about today, really, right? So who do we talk about today a lot? We talk about Darwin, right? Charles Darwin. Who was he? Uh, he was a British naturalist, meaning he just studied the natural world, right? And he ends up, he goes on um, a boat. It's called the HMS Beagle in 1831. So he's actually pretty young here, right? Even though when we look at pictures, um, a lot of times we see Darwin as this. But when he starts to do kind of his research, um, he's pretty young. He didn't set out really to investigate natural selection. It just kind of comes about. So his goal on the Beagle was actually to chart the South American coastline. But as he's doing this, he is making observations about the natural world, about things that he's seeing, and they actually stop in the Galapagos Islands. And you might hear um, have an association right already with Darwin and the Galapagos Islands because that's where we kind of start to talk about his theory coming about and uh, his finches. So where are the Galapagos Islands, right? They're kind of off South America here and they're a group of islands, um, but they're not too far from South America. We'll kind of talk about that in a second. And when he's on his trip, he starts to notice the animal, the animal species he sees live nowhere else in the world, but they kind of remember or resemble, excuse me, some of the species living on the South American mainland. So there are similar organisms around the world, but there are differences when they're in different environments, right? And this really starts to change his thinking about the world and how um, this change would happen in organisms and how they're actually related to each other. So he starts collecting evidence and he's kind of really the first person to sort of like collect this type of evidence. He collects fossils, he writes down his evidence in journals, things like that. Um, so he has something to reference and if you're looking for how he traveled, this is, this is kind of how they traveled and here are the Galapagos Islands there. So why do we talk about the Galapagos Islands? Well, one, they're islands, and so they provide kind of like isolated environments, right? Because they're surrounded by water, but at the same time, he notices that they have some similarities in the organisms that are there, even though they're not exactly the same. And he actually studies lots of things. He studies tortoises, birds, other, other organisms that he seeds, but one of them we talk a lot about is the finches. A finch is a type of bird. And he notices that there are small populations of the original South American finches that look kind of like the other finches he saw, but maybe not identical, right? And he also notices that when he looks at the different islands in comparison to each other, they also look a little bit different, right? They have variation in their beaks. And he starts to think like, well, when he watches them, they eat different food, right? And perhaps this variation in their beaks um, allows them to obtain food successfully in the slightly different environments, say on slightly different um, islands, right? So what do we kind of think? Well, these Galapagos Islands, they're about 600 miles from the equator, which seems pretty far for birds to get, right? Which it is. Um, but it's possible that maybe one or two were able to reach the islands and then if they were able to be there and survive over really, 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 really long amounts of time, right? Um, adaptations that were advantageous to that specific um, finch, right, would start to become more prominent because they were the ones that would survive and live, right? So over many generations, the populations of finches changed anatomically and behaviorally. They accumulated advantageous traits in their population, and eventually this would lead to the emergence of different species. So when we look at all his finches, right, this is just a picture um, of some of the finches that he saw on the different islands. And you can tell that they look kind of the same, right? But some, some of their beaks are different because they have a little bit different purpose. 
So what were Dar Darwin's ideas? Darwin comes along with the idea of variation. Variation exists in natural populations. Um, they, a population has to have many more offspring are born each season than can possibly survive to maturity. And as a result of this, there's a struggle for the existence of food, uh, space, mates, nutrients, light. In other words, because there's more organisms than can actually survive, this creates competition. They're competing for resources. And over time, right, you get characteristics that are beneficial. Okay, in the struggle for existence, these characteristics that are beneficial for survival will tend to become more common in the population because of competition, right? Um, changing the average characteristics of the population. These are now what we call adaptations. And over long periods of time and given steady input into new variation into a population, these processes lead to the emergence of a new species. So, this is basically Darwin's ideas that he comes about with. And now, right, we turn these into something we call natural selection, right? Refer he refers to all of these traits together, coming these factors coming together as natural selection. You have to have variation. You have to produce more offspring that can survive, that creates competition. And that competition, right, causes advantageous traits to kind of uh, become more prominent, right? And this differential survival, we now call these traits adaptations, okay? That's Darwin's idea. So how does Darwin differ from Lamarck a little bit, right? Well, Lamarck said that through use and disuse, you could change a certain characteristic in an organism. It was acquired over uh, basically the lifespan of an organism. Darwin, on the other hand, said, well, I think that there are just variety of giraffes, say, in the population, right? Uh, there are different genes, and so some giraffes end up with longer necks, and some giraffes end up with shorter necks. And because giraffes with longer necks can reach the food and therefore are more likely to survive over really long periods of time, the population of, gen of giraffes will start to see longer necks as a whole because they're the giraffes that survive and reproduce um, and pass those traits along to their offspring. So this, as scientists, is how we explain the process of evolution today, this idea, this theory of natural selection. And I want to bring something up quickly about a theory, right? A theory in science, um, yes, it can change over time, but theory, scientific theories are pretty well supported by the scientific community, meaning evidence that we see over and over and over again kind of supports that this is the explanation for some sort of phenomenon that is happening. So that's why as a scientific community that we use natural selection to support the idea of evolution because we see it over and over and over again. One last thing in this video, there's actually kind of um, another piece to this puzzle. You might know that Darwin goes on, eventually he writes his book um, in which he publishes his ideas about the theory of natural selection. Um, but sometimes we refer to Darwin as the survival of the fittest. You'll hear, right, um, people kind of throw that phrase around. Well, it's not actually really attributed to Darwin as being this idea that if you are more fit in an environment, you are more likely to survive. It's actually to a scientist called um, Alfred Wallace, who plays an important role in here. And sometimes we refer to him as the forgotten scientist. And instead of me talking about it, I want you to go ahead and watch um, this quick video. It's about eight minutes. I think it'll give you a good idea of the role that he played too, and this idea that Darwin wasn't the only person out there investigating this. I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you soon.